So, let's get started. That's it. So, my name is Bjorn. I'm a developer. Hi, Bjorn. Oh. Hi. <laughs> 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 um, that tries too much. Yeah. I'm a developer. My name is Barry in the country of people, which is why there was a little Barry on the other side. So, let's get started. What is an environment variable? An environment variable is something that belongs to each pro uh, When you run a process on a Unix system, you have a little bit of a sandbox, simplified, which where you can store a little bit of information about what is currently running. Some of this information envi is environment variables, and they can control what you can see, and they can control various aspects of your program. You have some that can set which time zone you're in, except the language you have, a bunch of different information. If you're running on a Roku, you have seen it in different places and how it gets used. So. And one key thing when it comes to environment variables is how do you set them? And um, see? So this easy way, set my name. I want to output my name, it comes out in the terminal, all writing now in my bash prompt or CSH or whatever. But the interesting part is by doing that, I'm not making it available anywhere. It is just an environment variable, but it's not available for anyone else. Which is the magic thing with export, which makes it so that any program that you execute from the current shell will inherit all the variables available to you. Which gets really important when you're looking with your working with your variables in other places. Which we'll come into, like, starting off. Let's see. Pop quiz. Anyone can guess what this does? So we take my AWS access key, which is fake, and I create an S3 bucket for red.rubyconf, because I can. Which, you know, is an environment variable. It's safe, it's on the computer. Nothing could be could be wrong with this. You just continue on. Uh, Anything in your environment variable is available to anyone on your computer. Which might be fine, but probably not. So if you're in a shared environment, which you are in many hosting environments, everything you have available is visible everywhere. So if I run a little example here, you can see that if I just do a PS, I can see everything, every single environment variable I've set. So you can see here that I have Haskell installed and a bunch of other weird stuff in my environment just from checking that PID from a sleep command. Sleep does nothing, it just waits. Why would you know that? And another thing with environment variables, there's a bunch of them that you get by default. So you have your bash variable, you have your home variable, you have your shell variable, flag, etc. Um, they're all being set by a very good bunch of places in your system with something that's called a login shell by default. So when you start your environment in your shell, it will load ah, there we go. It will load everything from this place. And excuse me. Let's Here. This is a custom shell script that you can run whenever you start a new shell. That is running as a, log as a login shell. And a login shell is a special thing that runs whenever you start a new terminal. So anything that you run as a shell script will by default not load them. And it will also load your bash RC, CSHRC, and so on. I'm sorry, my speaker notes are messed up and I'm losing, I'm losing track. Sorry about that. Okay. If anyone has any questions, because I feel that was slightly confusing because I got lost. Please, please raise hands, ask. So, 
all of this, why is it important? Well, so your environment variable sets a lot of stuff for you in your, when you're running things. And one of the best examples of how everything works is RBM, PyM, and the like, RBM as well. Because the way it works is that it mocks about with your path. Your path is a place where you have access to all your programs on your well, to apps on your computer. And whenever you try to launch something, it will look through your environment, environment one by one and see, does there exist a program here that is named what I expect it to be? So for instance, if I wanted to find Ruby, and we can see here in my environment that there is Ruby somewhere. So we'll start at, first off, bin, because it knows bin. We'll then check user bin, and then it goes to user local bin and find, okay, there's a Ruby version here. But the problem here was that I wanted it to find the RBN Ruby, which is defined. I have Ruby version 2.3.3, and I don't have version 2.0, which has come by default with my older version of OS X, which is an issue because then I have to move things around to get it to the right version that I want. So that is a usual problem that you often find if you start out and you have no idea about this, that you just have to change the orders it comes first, left to right. Um, this comes all into debugging. Because I've noticed over the last year that I've been spending a lot of time dealing with environment variables and production settings. Because the problem is it doesn't always get set. Or it does get set, but it doesn't get set by who you think you're setting it. So it gets all messed up. So for instance, in its scripts, um, you're not running your script as login shells. You have no idea what RBM, where RBM is. <coughs> so you're running your thing, you're testing it out, you're on, in your terminal, you're running your script, it's all working. You start running it in cron tab, it's not working anymore. What's up with that? Well, tag on, tag on bash L at the end of bash, and you'll probably, probably start working. Some programs don't inherit the environment at all because they see, think that's insecure. Nginx is a good example of this, and I have a story about how I had an issue with Nginx that took me hours to figure out why it wasn't finding Ruby. And there's also lots of, the, the main way of solving this is either by start writing lots of wrapper scripts. Well, that's basically the only way to solve this in a sensible way. So you end up having something that calls your script in the end, but, which works out, but it's annoying. So an example of this is that at work, we were using Ruby version 2.0.0 with WKHTML. And with Passenger, we were trying to mimic our production environments. We were running Nginx locally. And everything was working until we upgraded to 2.1.3. So when we did that, all of a sudden, WKHTML was saying, no, 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 I'm running 2.0.0 like I always have. So why would it do that? It doesn't make any sense. I've told it that you're running 2.2.3, or 213. But the problem was that Nginx wasn't setting path at all. So I had to set it to use, like, okay, now use my shits. And then it did use it, and it worked through. But WKHTML was running everything through the environment. And it was picking up and finding that, oh, yeah, there's a Ruby version file in my home directory, and all of a sudden you're running 2.0.0 anyways. And all of this is messed up because who would think of finding something like this? So, yeah. This is the fun stuff doing DevOps, guys. So, the fun part here is how the RBM shoes work. Does anyone here actually know how RBM works? Is silence. So, RBM shims are kind of cool because the way they work is that they install a binary in your path, like a small shell script. So, when you run Ruby, it will check, okay, what are my current Ruby versions that are installed? It will then check, do I have a .ruby version file that I can use? And then it will replace the current version of what you have with that Ruby version. But if you get started in the wrong location, it might go off and take something completely different, which is what happened in my case. <coughs> And it doesn't even matter when you get your stuff set if it gets completely wrong. 
another interesting thing that happened, we were running a Python script that was running. And for some reason, it was telling me it was 1968, it was running ASCII encoding, and it was blowing up because of a Chinese name. Which doesn't make sense, it was an Ubuntu box. It is today, it's like 2016, it knows how to deal with UTF-8. Our sysadmin was telling us everything is fine, I'm logged into the server, look at my output for my, for my prompt, look at me typing EMD, I can see all my things, and it's saying NES UTF-8. But Python was running inside of something called Supervisor D that removes everything in the environment. Nothing was there. And by default, it uses POSIX, which knows A to C. Completely pointless. So we set our environment variable, and we checked it out, and we can see what it was set, and then it worked. Another small case of something you can find. I love RubyMine. I'm sure people will not, not be happy to hear that because you know Yay, but we all have to we have to have we want, we have to grow up. Stop using them and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I know this someone. I've been arguing for Emacs at work, but apparently that's also bad. <laughs> oh guys. Should it be this way? <laughs> So we're running RubyMine, we're trying to run our test suite, we're running our spec. And it keeps telling me Ruby doesn't have a Ruby. Well, so I know it's, I can see that it's pointing to my, to my shim folder. And we talked about how shims work. So I looked in my shims folder and it's like, oh no, it, it, there's actually no Rubies here. <clears throat> and then I checked at my, at the path, where, where is my shim folder? And it points to the one that's installed by home. So remove the .rbm in the home folder and all of a sudden RubyMine starts working because it's all about the path. So pulling together. Check your path. It's one of these tiny little things but it keeps coming up. I was also building at one point Passenger and trying to get it to work together with Apache. And the same thing, it didn't know where Apache was in home group. It just it keeps popping up. And the easiest way to check it is just to do env, and it will tell you print out every single environment variable in the current shell. So, or in the current place where you're running. It's super useful for debugging. There are a bunch of environment variables that change drastically the way your program behaves. TC, for instance, sets the time zone. Uh, if you have a server that's configured to run in London, or UTC as it's called, and you need to output a timestamp that is in Singapore time, you can set TC to be either GMT plus 8 or Asia slash Singapore, and it will know how to output it to make here. This is one of the few reasons I ended up writing a Perl script in a Solaris box because there's only one that listened to it. And your basic Unix skills pays off. So learn some Unix. It's all good. So please. And I'm sorry. I feel that I was very confusing and bad today. I got really distracted with my notes off. So it's a happy dog instead. <laughs> and because you're still a captive audience, you get to hear about some Ruby gems I made. So I've been working at ah, got it. There we are. I've been working at a big-ish Rails project over the last year, and we've had some really weird requirements at times. So one of the weird things we have is that our app is split view. It has a public-facing site, which is all HTTPS everywhere, always. Then we have an internal side that cannot be HTTPS everywhere, no, never, because then you can't inspect the traffic because of security. So a gem to, to remove and add the secure flag on cookies. Very niche use case, but if you have it, it's available. <laughs> Another fairly niche use case is remote rails rate runner. So this is that we're having a really large test group one that takes two hours to run. And we started out, it was really small, and it ran really fast. And we were using rate tasks to get our cucumber stuff up and set up. 
after nine months, running a single rig task took something like 11 to 12 seconds, most of it boot up time, which not very good. So this thing just hooks, you put it in, it's a Rails engine, sits in your, in your app, and you hit it with a get request, and we'll give back whatever the rate task is, it's usually in a second. So if you have special needs, that might be good. So thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions for John? No, uh, not so much of a question, but um, like, well, in a way, yeah. Have you used the, the command which to like figure out what executable is actually running? Yes, I have. Uh, yeah. So most of the time, the issue is that you have to figure out where you are right now, and that's the main issue because which tells you what you're where you are in your current shell. So. Most of the time, when I've been in this position, running which in the context of where I was mm -hmm. trying, was nginx or anywhere else, was mostly confusing. It was usually easier to just print out my path variable or my environment totally. True. Okay. Uh, so, if anyone has any more questions, you can ask John separately. Uh, so, next.